So yesterday I focused on the gender dimensions of the economic crisis in well-off countries like uh, the UK and the USA and Ireland, and I drew most of my examples from that. Now I want to turn my attention to countries which are not wealthy countries, but uh, often known in the, the jargon as the, the middle and low income countries. And that's obviously a vast number of countries, and there are going to be gaps in what I have to say, and I will be able to talk a bit about uh, some of them, and hopefully some of you may know more uh, about what's happening in any countries that you particularly know about. So let me start off with my peg to hang this on. That's not a typo, by the way, women and children, all one word. It's a deliberate way of putting it, because I got concerned that a lot of the development agencies are talking about gender in this crisis with this kind of women and children. And there are these two quotations, and I could have found others, but one from the United Nations Development Program, women and children stand to bear the brunt of the global economic crisis, women and children are particularly vulnerable, uh, one that I came across when I was in Australia recently from the Australian AIDM program, targeting programs to meet the needs of vulnerable groups, in, including women and children. Maybe if we looked on the uh, USAID website, we might find something similar. Uh, and so I was concerned about this running together of women and children as one group and a, a vulnerable group that maybe needs rescuing by AusAid and uh, the United Nations Development Program. So I want to sort of put that in question a bit uh, and, and, um, and draw, draw out some of the uh, complexities and perhaps come to a more complex understanding of what uh, the gender dimensions of this crisis and a simple kind of running together of women and children as one huge vulnerable group. I also want to signal that the nature of the crisis uh, in um, middle income and low income countries is different from the crisis in wealthy countries. There, before we got the financial crisis emerging just about a year ago, there were already crises going on in uh, many, uh, particularly of low income countries connected with food security and fuel security. If you cast your minds back, we had a period of very rapidly rising um, fuel prices, price of uh, oil rising, price of fuel for cars rising, and uh, rising food prices, rapid rises in the prices of staple foods like rice uh, on international markets. Uh, so many, many low-income countries were already experiencing that kind of crisis. They were not experiencing a financial crisis, unlike some previous periods when uh, low-income and middle-income countries have been the ones experiencing a financial crisis uh, and the wealthy countries have not experienced that crisis. Uh, so there was the Asian financial crisis in 1997, there were economic crises in the early 90s in some of the countries making the transition from centrally planned economies to market-oriented economies. Um, back in the early 80s, there was a crisis in many Latin American countries, beginning with Mexico, uh, related to the uh, issue of the uh, debt repayments. So there have been financial crises in middle-income and low-income countries, several over the last 30 years, um, but they didn't take place uh, in the conjunct they, 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 this crisis therefore is different in the sense that the financial crisis began in the heartlands of uh, global capitalism in Wall Street and City of London, um, and it's been transmitted to middle-income and low-income countries through a number of channels. So that, that recession um, and that, uh, that financial crisis that was happening here a year ago and the, the recession that gathered speed after that has then been transmitted uh, to middle income and low income countries around the world. I'll uh, again use this uh, framework that I used yesterday and I'll say again, I, I think of this as patchwork quilt that I'm trying to embroider some of the squares and uh, I know a little bit more about some squares than others and uh, for some countries than others. But the idea is to look at uh, three 
sectors of economic activity in considering the crisis. So one is the financial sector, the other is a production, and the other is social reproduction, a term that's been current in feminist analysis now for, for quite some years, uh, to, to look at uh, the activities of unpaid work, non-market work, in families and communities that are so central to caring for people. Uh, and if we're talking about low-income countries in particular, that unpaid work goes well beyond anything you would find in the United States or the UK. So to care for your family in a low-income country in Africa or Central America, as many of you will know, uh, you can't just turn on the tap and switch on the light uh, in many parts of the country. Uh, if you're trying to make a meal, for instance, you've got to go out first and collect the water. If you're lucky, from a well or a standpipe not too far away. If you're not so lucky, you're going to have to walk quite a distance to go uh, to a river or a pond and collect it and carry it back. Uh, similarly with fuel, um, you're going to have to collect wood, uh, firewood, or you're going to have to make um, fuel out of uh, dung, making uh, fuel cakes out of cow dung, um, or, or you're going to have to um, uh, get charcoal, uh, so you're not going to be able to switch on um, a switch and get some electricity or gas. And that work, that onerous unpaid work, connected with fuel and energy that you need as inputs in order to be able to care uh, for your family. That is work that's disproportionately done by women and girls. Although men do some of it, um, all the evidence we've got for middle income, well, low income countries around the world uh, suggests it's mainly women and girls who do that work, work of collecting the water and uh, the fuel. Uh, and they have to do that on top of all the other kind of jobs that, say, would be disproportionately done by women and girls in the UK and the USA, like uh, cooking and cleaning and uh, childcare and elder care. Which is not to say men don't participate in some of this, and boys too, but the bulk of it is done by women and girls. And it's that work that both is central to the well-being of families and communities, and it's also really important for the economy and the growth of the economy because it's that work that keeps people going back to the fields, uh, to the factories, uh, to the offices, uh, uh, to the banks, um, uh, to run those other two sectors, the production and the finance sector. And thinking about those uh, sectors, the gender dimensions of those sectors, I've um, identified three kinds of areas that I wanted to try and look at. I can't look at them all in the same degree of detail at the moment. But one is somehow called divisions, which is really uh, trying to get uh, quantitative data and disaggregate it by sex to see what's happening to men, what's happening to women, what's happening to boys, what's happening to girls. The second is norms. What are the social norms in countries about what men and boys are supposed to do, what women and girls are supposed to do, the kind of jobs they're supposed to do, the kinds of responsibilities they're supposed to take on. Uh, just as in the USA and in many other countries, there are those strong norms about the kinds of roles and responsibilities that men and women or boys and girls take on. And the third thing is rights. Um, what kinds of uh, rights, both uh, labour rights, um, rights to uh, non-discrimination, rights to public services, what's happening to kind of rights uh, that are very important for gender equality issues. So I'll be trying to pick up in, in, in varying degrees on those kinds of issues. And I'll be looking at three aspects of the crisis. The first one I, I've labeled transmission. As I said, in middle-income, low-income countries, it's a matter of a crisis being transmitted from the well-off countries where it started. So the, the channels of transmission are what I've got here under this um, column, transmission. Uh, falls in the finance world, it falls in bank lending. You know, with it falls in bank lending here, well, that's also spilt over uh, international banks that lend around the world, so falls in bank lending. 
falls in foreign investment, um, less so in direct foreign investment of companies setting up mines or factories, more so in what's called portfolio investment, uh, buying shares and buying government bonds. So those have fallen. Um, foreign aid, um, so far, uh, not, uh, it's, ke it's kept up reasonably well, but lots of indicators that it's going to be falling um, and that countries are not keeping the pledges that they have made at various meetings over the last two or three years about increasing uh, aid to uh, low-income countries in particular and faced with uh, crises at home. Countries like Italy, for instance, have already started to cut their foreign aid. So that's less resources available to um, governments and to non-governmental organizations, particularly in low-income countries. Falls in export demand. Uh, we aren't rushing out to buy so many new computers or new t-shirts at the moment as we were in the past. And so uh, that is um, leads to a fall in export demand. And our businesses in, in uh, rich countries aren't buying as much um, uh, minerals or, or the raw materials as they were in the past. So fall in demand for the exports at low and middle income countries. Produce fall in demands for tourism too, so people aren't taking so many foreign holidays and that's affecting other countries in which we're relying on tourism to generate earnings. And fall in remittances. Uh, lots of migration from middle income low-income countries. For some low-income countries, remittances for migrants has absolutely been crucial uh, to improvements in prosperity there over the last few years. And, um, well, migrants uh, in rich countries are either losing their jobs or they may be hanging on to their jobs but with lower earnings, with, with less hours of work, with wage cuts of various kinds. Uh, they might even have to, some of, in some cases, be returning to the countries that they came from. But we do know that migrants' remittances have fallen a lot, and that will particularly hard hit countries that had relied a lot over the past decade on migrants' remittances. So all of those, uh, those channels of transmission mean there's going to be an impact, both short-run, long-run impacts uh, on production and on social reproduction. Uh, and states and households um, are going to be, have to make some responses to those impacts. So th those are things I want to try and unpack a little bit. But I want to signal, of course, that there are lots of important intersections and diversities and not be able to go into these in a lot of detail, um, but there will gender obviously intersects with issues of uh, race and, and ethnicity, with class, with age, with location, and the resources I'm going to draw on are with a particular focus for low-income people in low-income countries. So there are quite a lot of middle-income countries in, say, um, uh, in Eastern Europe and the Baltic region and so forth. I'm not going to have anything to say uh, about what's happening there. Um, uh, perhaps a little bit about countries um, um, like South Africa or China um, that are more middle income countries now and then uh, some of the really much lower income countries in the Central American Africa. Let just talk a little bit more about the impacts in the financial sector. Um, it means a credit squeeze and so it means it's harder for small businesses all around the world to borrow and small businesses very often require uh, continual financing. They've relied on the, in the past on uh, banks to roll over their loans to offer them refinancing each year. It's become harder to get that. But uh, low income women don't get their loans from the regular banks. Um, they either get loans from uh, microfinance institutions that have been experienced a big growth in many parts of the world. Um, or they get them from self-help groups, rotating saving and loans institutions, or they get them from very expensive uh, informal sources of loans like money lenders of various kinds. Now, there is a hope that the, the microfinance institutions might be 
relatively shock resistant because they're not so linked in with the international financial system. Um, and I think though this is something that needs some investigating because I just read something this afternoon about um, quite a lot of the microfinance institutions in Africa, for instance, get part of their funding from these more formal sector banks. And so there may be a knock-on effect for them. Also, if we're thinking of those more self-help rotating savings and loan organizations, they depend on uh, poor women in particular being able to put in a, lot, a little bit of money each week. Uh, and then one, once a month it's your turn, or once a year it's your turn to get some money out of that loan. But of course it can be harder uh, for women to carry on making those uh, little uh, savings. And so the, um, those rotating uh, savings and loan institutions may also come under pressure. And also, uh, as we'll see from some of the information I'm going to talk about uh, a little later on, poor women may need additional credit in recession. They may, may need additional credit to tide their businesses over uh, difficult patches, and they may need uh, additional credit to finance essential consumption. And so we may be having a situation where there's both more demand for credit on the part of uh, poor women, but also less availability of credit to them. Impact in the production sector. Uh, yesterday I began by talking about unemployment figures for uh, UK and the USA, and uh, talking, comparing what the figures are showing about uh, about men's um, unemployment and women's unemployment. Not so easy to do that for low-income uh, countries, middle-income countries, um, because you actually can't afford to be unemployed uh, in countries that don't have any unemployment insurance unless you're a well-off person whose family uh, can support them. So the unemployment figures don't tell you uh, what you really need to know in the case of many low-income and middle-income countries, uh, because when people lose their jobs, uh, very often um, they, they, uh, they don't show up in unemployment figures um, because there aren't any um, unemployment benefits and because there aren't any jobs. If you go around with your labor force survey asking people are they looking for a job, they may say no because they don't think there are any jobs to look for. Uh, so that's known as the discouraged worker effect. And then the lack of unemployment benefits means you, you don't have a way of collecting the data through people who are claiming unemployment benefits. So we have reason to believe that the, the unemployment figures are not such um, a good source of information for middle income and low income countries. And uh, what's better, uh, best, better to look at if we can is data on job losses and data on loss of earnings. Um, uh, these are better short run indicators. And in the longer run, uh, we'll be wanting to look and see is there a growth of what the ILO, the International Labour Organization, calls precarious work. A work uh, that doesn't have regular hours, that doesn't have a long-term contract, that doesn't have uh, social insurance benefits, that doesn't have any rights to compensation if you lose the job. All those kinds of jobs um, that are more risky and don't have social protection. In the longer run, are we going to see a growth of that? Um, mentioned here the example of the 1997 financial crisis in South Korea. I've uh, got a PhD student from South Korea who's been working on this and what was the impact on a women's position in the labor market. And one of the longer run impacts was that uh, although total employment recovered after the financial crisis in South Korea fairly quickly, the structure of the labor market was permanently changed and there was more of this precarious employment than there had been before and that disproportionately affected women. So although both men and women, there were more of these precarious jobs and less of the secure jobs, uh, for women it was particularly marked and they were more concentrated in this area of the less secure jobs. So labor rights were permanently lost for both men and women, but particularly for women. And I think that will be one of the longer run effects that we'll be wanting to look out for, especially in the middle income countries uh, in Asia and Latin America. They might 
bounce back in terms of quantity of employment relatively quickly, but will it be at the expense of the quality of the employment? Will it entail uh, a loss of labour rights in particular for women? Well, what's, what's the kind of evidence that's emerging at the moment um, in the short run? Um, there's a very visible loss of jobs for women in the export sectors in many countries. Uh, you'll find there's uh, some discussion of this in a discussion paper published in March by Oxfam International called Paying the Price for the Economic Crisis, uh, which argues that job, uh, women's jobs are the first to go and um, argues that women are the backbone of industries that are being hard hit in the export sector and it goes down <coughs> in several countries you see there. Uh, Sri Lanka and Cambodia have lost uh, 30,000 jobs, mostly female, in the garment industry. Um, Nicaragua's export processing zone has lost 16,000 jobs. Uh, Philippines, um, 40,000 jobs, lost more than half from the export processing zones. And those of you who have studied export processing zones know that um, uh, usually they're disproportionately employers of women. So 70, 80 percent of jobs in export processing zones are women. So jobs in, uh, in these export-oriented garment industries and um, consumer electronics too um, have been uh, going, factories producing for export have been uh, dismissing workers and those workers have been mainly women. And their women's rights have been undermined in that process as well because even when they were entitled in law to some compensation for losing their jobs, um, the Oxfam report claims that it's got reports from partner organizations across Asia and Latin America of employers evading the payment of severance compensation. Um, and women in some countries have been then mobilizing, trying to demand they get that compensation, to which they are legally entitled, but it's often very difficult to enforce that legal right because the employer disappears. The factory closes down, the firm goes bankrupt, the employer disappears. And this is certainly what happened in the Asian financial crisis in 1997, and it seems to be happening again. So certainly uh, there, there's a sense in which, yes, um, women are, uh, in countries where the export sector is uh, particularly focused on industries like garments and elect consumer electronics, uh, women uh, are vulnerable to losing their jobs. Uh, they're not, they're not, that doesn't mean that they're passive in the face of this, uh, this onslaught. They, um, uh, is evidence of them mobilizing to demand their rights to severance payment, but they're in a very weak position, just as workers are here, to mobilize to demand that they hang on to their jobs. That's a much, much tougher thing to be able to do. Um, in the longer run, again, evidence that women's employment rights are, are undermined. Um, reports, again, from this Oxfam International discussion paper that women who are managing to hang on to their jobs are doing so at the price of cuts in wages and overtime, um, in increasingly precarious contracts so that they, <coughs> they don't have the kind of security. Uh, and losses of benefits like subsidised meals and transport, so a deterioration in uh, the rights that they previously enjoyed. Interesting uh, link here to the issue of global supply chains and ethical trade, uh, which uh, was picked up by um, the Oxfam report. Um, some of you may be aware that there's been a, a lot of attempts in the past 10, 15 years uh, in the garment industry to put pressure on the big name um, retail stores and branded uh, companies that produce branded goods both in the USA and Europe uh, to um, have uh, comply with various kinds of labor standards and to source from local companies and their suppliers in middle income and low income countries uh, that comply with these labor standards. But you can only comply with those labor standards if the uh, retailer, if the Walmarts of the world pay you enough money or the Nikes of the world pay you enough money to be able to meet those labor standards. And that's under huge pressure now. 
so this is a report that the, the ethical trade manager for one major global fashion brand uh, complained that um, uh, her firm was now under pressure to reduce uh, margins. Uh, her company is competing against other companies for your dollar, and uh, so there's uh, pressure to cut prices, and that's leading to pressure to uh, source uh, in, in low-income countries that can produce at the lowest price rather than comply with labour standards. Um, so uh, evidence coming in of UK companies abandoning suppliers with relatively good wages and conditions in Sri Lanka and China for lower wage zones um, uh, to with less, um, um, less uh, possibility of uh, local firms complying with labour standards. So I think this is an important aspect of the transmission uh, from uh, the rich to the poor countries. It's our uh, firms, our retailers, our big name uh, fashion brands, uh, which said over the last um, 10 years or so, oh, they were trying to improve labour standards and we could be sure that our uh, trainers or our sweatshirts or our t-shirts were not uh, produced by labour that um, was employed under conditions that did not meet international uh, labour standards as laid down by the ILO, that is under tremendous pressure now and there will be, the, the, that competition will be meaning that I think the, you know, the ethical trade manager herself may uh, find her job going and <laughs> more emphasis on just the lowest price and that will put pressure on the conditions of work and the quality of the jobs uh, that, that, that remain. And it would be very hard then to recover from that. But as I said yesterday, we have to look at what's happening to men's jobs as well. So in the short run, men also lose jobs. And I was trying this afternoon to get a little bit more information on this. And there wasn't as much information on the kind of jobs that men are losing as the kind of jobs that women are losing. But we know that um, in... Um, some countries, the export sector is a kind of sector that employs a lot of men. So if it's a mining sector, uh, as it is in Zambia, where copper mining is a major source of uh, export earnings, then it's men's jobs that are going to be under pressure. And indeed, in Zambia, uh, there have been uh, over 8,000 jobs lost in the copper mining industry, and that's going to be largely men. Uh, many African countries, it's uh, raw materials um, that uh, they've been exporting, and they've been exporting quite a lot to China. And as China's growth slows down, uh, that will put pressure on men's jobs in the export sector of countries which rely a lot on mining. And uh, as a recession starts to sort of ripple through the economies, it will do. It will hit the construction industry just as it has here. And um, in many countries, that's going to be mainly men. So we've got in Cambodia um, 15,000 construction workers losing their jobs. So not only are those women losing in Cambodia losing jobs in the garment sector, men are losing jobs in the construction industry. There are a few countries, such as India, which employ quite a lot of women in the construction industry. But <coughs> largely, uh, the construction industry is a more a male intensive uh, sector in terms of employment. So we will see men's jobs lost in mining and construction. In manufacturing, it depends on the mix. Um, figures I was looking at for Thailand this afternoon suggested there that uh, women uh, have been a bit harder hit than men in manufacturing. Uh, looking at electrical machinery, textiles and garments, motor vehicles and furniture, um, women lost 57% of the jobs that were lost. So manufacturing is a bit going to depend on what the mix of the sector is. So I think it's important to know that men are also vulnerable, uh, but we don't see, uh, we see women and children vulnerable group, we don't see men, women and children vulnerable group. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that, so um, men are also going to be vulnerable to the loss of jobs. Well, one question then that arises is, does the informal economy provide a cushion in low-income and middle-income countries? Uh, because in those countries, a large proportion of employment uh, comes um, is so-called informal employment. Uh, informal employment um, includes all employment in unregistered enterprises, uh, 
um, small, uh, maybe even medium-sized ones, small ones, um, self-employment, and it includes all employment that lacks rights to social protection, including self-employment and including home-based paid work, uh, home-based paid work where uh, you get uh, some contracts from a factory or from some, uh, some merchant and uh, you sit at home and sew garments or assemble toys or make carpets um, and you don't have any rights to social protection. And this kind of informal employment makes up a huge amount of the employment in cities of low-income, middle-income countries and accounts for more than 50% of their employment. So what's happening in the garment factory is only the tip of the iceberg. We have to know what's happening to all of those women who are sewing garments uh, at home, um, as well as what's happening in the factories. This informal employment employs men as well as women, but it is disproportionately female. And it serves domestic as well as export markets. And if you just look at the number of people employed in the sector, you will often see this rising in a recession. And this maybe gives rise to the idea that this uh, informal employment will provide some kind of cushion. You lose your job in the mine or the, uh, the garment factory or the building site, and then you go and try and uh, find some work uh, in informal employment, being a street vendor or a home-based worker or a waste picker or number of the jobs that you might try and do, other people who stand at the intersections and clean your car, uh, windscreens, um, all of those kinds of jobs. Um, so because it, it, you can enter into those jobs, but the issue is if you go in those jobs, you've got this rise of you know, people in informal employment, what is this actually doing to people's earnings? Is it providing any cushion in terms of the kind of earnings that people have? And I'm going to talk quite a bit about a study that just came out uh, by an organization whose initials are WEGO, uh, Women in Informal Employment Globalizing and Organizing, uh, which uh, the results of this study, and I'll tell about the study in more detail, is that no, the informal employment doesn't provide a cushion uh, because uh, informal workers through a variety of channels are losing earnings and are hard hit. So we shouldn't... Um, think, oh, well, it's okay, there's no unemployment insurance, but people can uh, find some kind of work in informal employment. So let me tell you a little bit more about this uh, study uh, by this international network, uh, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, which has partners in, uh, is a network of uh, organizations in many parts of the world, organizations that organize home-based workers, that um, in a network called HomeNet, uh, that organize street vendors in a network called StreetNet, uh, and have links with lots of uh, organizations of informal uh, workers in many parts of the world. And so they decided to conduct a study with their partner organizations in 10 cities. Durban in South Africa, you see there, Blantyre, Malawi, Nakuru in Kenya, uh, Lima in Peru, the Bangkok in Thailand, Malang in Indonesia, Kasur in Pakistan, Pune in India, Bogota in Colombia, and Santiago in Chile. And um, with their partner organizations, they designed a study that would, uh, that would both try and get a sense of what's happening to <laughs> informal employment in these different cities by uh, talking with their partner organizations who had an ear to the ground because they were uh, coordinating these networks of informal employers. And then doing more detailed study uh, through uh, interviews and focus group discussions with uh, 164 informal workers, so the ones they were able to interview in the end and involve in focus group discussions. 79% of these uh, informal workers were women, reflecting the fact that women are disproportionately in this sector, it is a, a more female sector. And they identified three occupations in particular to look at, waste pickers, home-based workers, and street vendors. Um, almost all of these three groups these 164 informal workers re reported loss of earnings due to falling prices, falling sales, 
and more competition for new entrants who've lost their jobs in formal employment. And we've got there the example of the South African uh, street vendor in Durban who's saying lots of factories near here have closed. Due to this recession, this has negatively impacted our business as these factory workers are our main uh, customers. So the street vendor's not selling to the international market, they're selling to the local market, uh, but the people they were selling to who were producing for the international market have lost their jobs. Um, the waste pickers were affected by changes in the, the international prices of, um, of recycled uh, goods, like different kinds of plastics. Um, and the home-based workers were, some of them were producing on subcontract, uh, things like garments for the international market, so they had less orders. And some of them were producing for the domestic market, but they had less orders as well because the people had less money to buy their goods. So the, the, um, um, the majority of them had this loss of earnings. They, nobody throws them out of their job because they're not an employee, but um, uh, they, they don't make as much money as they did before. They haven't got as much custom. And uh, um, there's a lot more detail in this study, which I think is, a, before I just go on to this next slide, let me say, I think this study is a very good example of the kind of work you can do if you are already positioned with a network, you know, with a network of partners in different parts of the world and using the classic tools of you know, sociological field work in terms of focus group discussions, uh, interviews with key informants that the local uh, organizations and uh, uh, some in-depth interview. So you get a picture of um, what's happening is the best thing I've seen, which really gives you some sense of what's happening at the grassroots level in, uh, as a result of the crisis in this, this sample of cities around the world. Well, that, uh, that, kind, that kind of uh, transmission mechanism, those kind of experiences in production is obviously going to have a negative impact in the sphere of social reproduction. There's going to be a loss of incomes. Uh, well, from the grassroots to the global estimate, um, the World Bank has just uh, recently produced estimates that an extra 53 million people uh, in low-income, uh, middle-income countries will be pushed below the $2 a day poverty line. The $2 a day poverty line, pretty low level of living, uh, but there are going to be another 53 million people, it's estimated, uh, pushed below that line because of this, the recession affecting uh, their livelihoods. Um, so to counterpoint that global estimate, just a, a, a story of a Cambodian factory worker related in the Oxfam study, which also shows it's not just loss of incomes, it can also be loss of home and assets. Uh, so she re relates, uh, I've lost my job, I've been evicted from my house, my belongings were confiscated by the landlord, now I rent a small uh, room with my husband and two children, and we've had to cut our spending on food. And I think that's a story that's likely to be repeated in many cities. So uh, here it's uh, people having their homes pe repossessed because they can't afford to pay the mortgage. Um, in the uh, low-income communities, in uh, cities in the low- and middle-income uh, countries, it'll probably be this. It will be them being thrown out because they can't pay the rent. So many w women are clearly at risk by it from losing their jobs, from losing their assets, from, from losing income. Uh, but so are men. They both are at risk, and their children are at risk. Um, but I think it's just wrong, wrong just to see women as a vulnerable group, because that uh, conveys a rather passive notion, uh, whereas women are very active in figuring out how to deal with these negative impacts. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So households have obviously got to respond to these negative impacts. And so the first thing is what kind of coping strategies might they devise? And it's not just households in the abstract don't devise sort of coping strategies. It has to be people within those households. And gender norms uh, in, around the world um, mean that just as in, uh, in Britain, uh, as in, in low-income, middle-income countries, it's largely the women who have that job of trying to cope when there's less money coming into the household. How do we feed the children? How do we pay the school fees? How do we buy new shoes for the children? 
a frequent response that women make is cutting back on non-essential spending and making more things at home. In other words, increasing their unpaid work. And um, there are some uh, examples of this in both the Oxfam study and the Uyghur study. So there's a home-based garment worker in Bangkok who uh, tries to economize by saving some of the spare material when she's made the garment she's contracted to make, and then um, making uh, this, using this leftover cloth to make clothes for herself now. Another home-based worker is doing what I guess lots of uh, American women are doing too, and they're no longer buying uh, ready meals. Uh, they're uh, having to cook more meals at home themselves, which of course means then they have less time for producing the, ho the home-based uh, uh, the, for the home-based work. And as I pointed out yesterday, these kinds of responses those two women um, um, tell uh, uh, about. Uh, uh, are, of course, quite a rational thing to do from the point of view of those women and their families, but what it's going to mean is less work for other people. If you make um, more clothes at home for yourself, there's less work for other women to make those clothes. If you make more meals at home for yourself, there's less work for those street vendors who are selling uh, ready meals. So this is what I called yesterday the paradox of thrift. There is this thrifty response, and it's women's responsibility to devise this thrifty response of making more at home and buying less. But that actually spreads the recession further. My paradox is your loss of earnings and uh, a job. And there's also a limit to which unpaid work can substitute for paid work. You have to have money for some things. Uh, you can't meet your own um, school fees. Uh, you can't uh, knit your own children's shoes. Uh, and a very poignant uh, quote there from a, a, a woman street trader in the South Africa in the Durban study, talking about she's unable to provide for her grandchildren. She's got the responsibility for her grandchildren, quite possibly because her parents have, have uh, died as a result of the HIV AIDS crisis. Uh, I cannot sleep at night. I'm worried about money. I don't know how I'm going to take care of them. So you actually can't do without money as well. There's a limit to which you can um, cut back on spending through making things for yourself, but you need money as well. And that may mean uh, uh, you also have to move into desperation measures. We hear a lot about coping strategies. I don't think we hear enough about desperation measures because coping strategies sounds as if, you know, well, it's difficult, but people are getting by, but they're not getting by quite a lot of them. And the Uyghur study uh, reports then, when you've cut the non-essential spending, you have to cut the essential spending. And it, it has uh, reports of um, informal workers reducing the number of meals uh, that they have and uh, being forced to cut out uh, milk and meat for their children. And uh, as the Colombian waste speaker says, you know, do you know what it's like to have your kids awake at midnight telling you that they're hungry? So it's you, you can't cope with that. It's a desperation measures. Um, the Cambodian women worker talks about the ill health that she's now subject to because of cutting back on food, medicine, and other necessities. So you cut to the bone. Uh, then you may have to borrow in informal credit markets at very high rates of interest. You Not every woman has got a friendly uh, microfinance institution or a rotating uh, savings and loans organization she can rely on. Uh, many have to recourse, as they do here too, to loan sharks who have very, very high rates of interest in order to pay the school fees, in order to pay the essential medicines. Selling new remaining assets uh, you, that give you that maybe last bit of autonomy, like your jewelry, which is an important source of uh, of, a, of an asset for low-income women, uh, your sewing machine, and how can you earn a livelihood? And um, uh, some may also turn to sex work. There's a report there from uh, Thailand suggesting that um, uh, sex traffickers are um, approaching women who've lost their jobs in factories. We shouldn't get into a moral panic about this, uh, and sometimes you find uh, reports of um, um, women factory workers losing their jobs and turning uh, to sex work without really much evidence that this is the case. People think it might be the case, but it's obviously a hard thing to 
to investigate and uh, sometimes you get uh, alarmist stories that might not um, have basis in fact um, but I think that um, uh, there probably will be an increase in, uh, in sex work if there's nothing else uh, that you can do to, uh, to um, cope. And those uh, desperation measures have irreversible adverse effects and I think this is an important difference between the nature of the crisis in the rich countries and in the middle income and low income countries. In low income households in low income countries it's not just a matter of, uh, well, we go through hard times for two or three years. Uh, the, the hardness of those times may have irreversible adverse effects. So children drop out of school and, may, and an increase in child labor and the informal employment, and they may never, never be able to go back. Um, children are malnourished. Um, wasting and stunting in small children has permanent impacts upon their health and also um, the mental capacities of small children. Uh, women are malnourished, that means complications in pregnancy and low birth weight babies. Low birth weight babies also start off at a disadvantage and have continuing disadvantages. And people, men, women, children die prematurely. So the World Bank has um, this estimate of an increase of uh, 200,000, 400,000 deaths annually as a result of this crisis, driven by increasing malnutrition. And as well as that, we're going to see increases in maternal mortality because of uh, women uh, being uh, malnourished and because of the inability to maintain medical services and of the inability of people to pay the kind of uh, either official or unofficial payments that you need to pay to get um, decent uh, treatment uh, in, uh, in childbirth in many countries. Um, probably increases in alcohol and violence related deaths among men. That was very marked in the kind of crisis that we saw in um, uh, Eastern uh, Europe and parts of the former Soviet Union in the crisis that accompanied the transition from centrally planned economies to the market. So there's no going back from that. So I think that's the, the, the seriousness of that crisis, uh, the, the crisis that was created here for uh, uh, low-income people in low-income countries, is that there are some things you can cope with with a lot of difficulty, but there are some things that are going to have irreversible adverse impacts uh, to which all low-income people are going to be vulnerable. Uh, I spoke yesterday about the, the need for collective responses then. So women are resourceful in trying to meet the challenges, uh, and, uh, uh, but there's a limit to what they can do on their own. Uh, one kind of collective response is to get organized at the grassroots level in order to make, um, to try and support one another and also to make demands um, on the government. And the informal workers in the WIGO study um, uh, saw the need for them to become organized and become better organized in order to make demands on their governments to respond to the crisis and the sorts of things they were interested in their government doing. Um, food, uh, provide food staples at subsidized rates to poor communities and maybe open um, community kitchens. Education to allow children to continue at school even if the parents couldn't afford the fees because although education may be free here, it's not free uh, even at the primary level in some of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, business support for their informal businesses. They, they said they, they were having difficulty getting loans and they needed more low interest loans. And that leads me to my, my final set of slides, which is really to talk about what a government's doing in, this, in response to this, what kind of collective response is there in the sense of a response by governments um, to uh, respond to those, those adverse impacts. Well, um, some governments, particularly in Asia, and actually also, although I haven't listed them, the better off countries in Latin America, have introduced fiscal stimulus comparable, similar to the kind of idea you have in the USA and we've had in quite a lot of European countries, extra government spending, um, uh, uh, extra, and I talked yesterday about in, in Europe and North America, cars and roads, 
Cars and roads is also the focus of this extra spending in countries like India, uh, Brazil, uh, Mexico, to some extent in China, although China has also very interestingly devoted some of the fiscal stimulus to trying to rebuild uh, the health system, particularly in rural areas, and that's an encouraging sign. Uh, but lots of governments, particularly in smaller and poorer countries, have not introduced a fiscal stimulus. And it's argued that they can't do this, that they have no, in the jargon, fiscal space to do this, because unlike the USA and UK, they can't finance increases in public expenditure. They can't borrow on the international markets in order to finance the increases in public expenditure. China will fund the US uh, budget deficit and an expansion in that by buying um, treasury bonds, but they're not going to buy the treasury bonds of Nicaragua or Rwanda or uh, uh, the um, Zambia, etc. So those um, low-income countries find it very hard to do the kind of uh, fiscal stimulus response. And a UNESCO report uh, recently has argued that 43 out of 48 low-income countries have no fiscal space for a stimulus. Well, to some extent, this, this problem of financing for low-income um, small countries as it was recognized by the G20 uh, when it uh, first met last year to respond to the crisis. Remember one of the implications, one of the pressures of the financial crisis is we say it can no longer be a rich man's club of the G7 countries uh, that can discuss what's happening to the global economy. It's got to be broadened to be the G20 which includes countries like South Africa, China, Brazil and India. The big um, middle-income countries. Uh, and so they recognize there's a problem uh, from the point of view of the poorer and smaller countries. They can't do what China, India, Brazil, and South Africa can do. And so it was, uh, so, well, like, they need extra funding. And one agreement was that extra funding would be made available to them through giving more money to the International Monetary Fund. I think quite a lot of us who worked on development issues over the years, our hearts sank when we heard that that was regarded as the way to uh, help uh, uh, poor developing countries because uh, those IMF um, loans are likely to come at a price. Um, they're likely to still have attached to them the kinds of strings that the IMF was always attached to loans, uh, cutting public expenditure, um, privatizing services uh, and those policies in the past have not been very good for promoting gender equality and not been very good for enhancing the well-being of poor women. Uh, this is one of the things that um, with a colleague in another project I'm trying to look at a little bit more. The IMF's getting more money, has it changed the kind of approach it's taking? Or is it still uh, 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 attaching these neoliberal economic conditions to the loans? Uh, I have to say at the outset, it looks like, well, there's been a rediscovery of Keynesianism for some in the sense that it's okay to expand public expenditure to try and offset the recession. Uh, but for many uh, poor countries, it seems to be business as usual and uh, neoliberalism for them. But this, this merits further research. Even in countries where there's been a fiscal stimulus, the issue has been raised, as I was saying it had been raised here, is is this only jobs for the boys? Uh, the Oxfam report um, reports uh, concerns on this. A um, story about the Philippines where the day after the reports of the loss of 42,000 jobs in garments and electronics, uh, the government announced the creation of 41,000 new jobs, but in infrastructure projects that were not likely to create jobs for the women who lost uh, their jobs in garments and electronics. Uh, in India, I'm in touch with uh, uh, some feminist economists in India who have been uh, monitoring this, and they're very worried there that the stimulus, as it has, I said here, and in the UK and Germany too, has focused quite a bit on the car industry and has ignored the very, very large informal sector in India. Um, in India, um, all civil servants who are entitled to a car, and there's a large number of civil servants who are entitled to have a, a car, an official car in India, were told to go, they should order new cars. 
and the government would buy lots of new cars uh, to prop up uh, the jobs in the car industry. Uh, but there wasn't, um, as the uh, Indian uh, feminist economist has said to me, nobody thought, well, maybe they should uh, all be asked to go and order uh, new sets of table mats and coasters and uh, fabric binders for their offices um, that uh, would stimulate employment for, for these uh, home-based workers in the informal economy. Of course, we have to recognize that even if the fiscal stimulus in its first round uh, mainly creates jobs for, the, for men in, in construction and the car industry and, and jobs like that, uh, and it's true, as I said, men are losing their jobs, they need jobs too, that those jobs will eventually have multiplier effects. If you get those construction workers back to work, they will start buying again from the street vendors selling uh, prepared lunches at the, the entrance to the building site. But it may, and that will eventually, you know, work its way through the economy and, and, and have some benefits for low-income women who've lost their jobs, even if it doesn't directly get to them. But it can take a long time for that to happen. And in the meantime, we've seen those adverse, irreversible effects that can be happening. So I think there is a case for a quicker, um, quicker acting measures um, that the fiscal stimulus uh, should in include some quicker acting measures that address um, the needs of um, women as well as men and, and support their coping strategies. Uh, some uh, addressing the informal economy directly, smallholder agriculture, I've had no time to go into this, but that's really, really important. Um, for addressing the food security issues, especially in, in many African and Central American countries, and also to directly increase the purchasing power of poor women through cash transfers. Quite a lot of middle income and low, and I'm nearly reached the end now, quite a lot of low income and middle income countries have been introducing cash transfers um, uh, targeted uh, at uh, women in poor households, both in male-headed households and uh, uh, women who are on their own. Uh, in some countries in Latin America, it's been gone along with conditions about sending your children to a school and a clinic, and there's a lot of controversy about the pros and cons of those conditions, uh, but at least they put um, money in the hands of women. And of course, you could put money in the hands of women without attaching those conditions to it. So um, beefing up those kinds of cash transfers and making them unconditional if possible would also um, be a quick acting way of um, supporting um, low income women as they try to work out those coping strategies for their families. You could also try and increase the fiscal space that the government's got and to improve its use by changing the kind of rules that the IMF uh, uses and conditions it attaches, by maintaining aid flows, by increasing tax revenue uh, through measures like abolishing tax havens and introducing uh, currency transaction taxes. So a lot of ideas floating around now about how you could uh, help um, governments in middle income, low income countries to raise more money on their own. Um, uh, Maybe there'll be a bit of progress on that. And then, of course, if you, if you have created more fiscal space for governments, it's important how they use that. Uh, it's important that they use it in a way that's gender responsive in the sense of uh, um, bearing in mind um, uh, issues of gender equality, women's rights, and the need to support low-income women as they uh, try to maintain coping strategies rather than be driven to desperation measures. And there is, there is in many countries around the world been over the last 10 years uh, efforts by women's groups, by women elected representatives to try and get their governments to make a bit more, pay a bit more attention uh, to gender equality issues when they, when they allocate money. Um, it's important, I think, to strengthen those so that if there, there is a, a, an effort to try and preserve and maybe expand public expenditure, we can make sure that it is going to support um, uh, low-income women. And it's important to enable women to have more voice in determining and monitoring government budgets as elected representatives and in civic watchdog groups. 
so just by way of conclusions then, I said this is a kind of work in progress. Um, it's true that many women in low and middle income countries are at risk, but so are many men. Uh, and we should remember that.